In this video, we're going to be talking about PCB delay matching and PCB delay tuning, which oftentimes will incorrectly be referred to as length matching or length tuning. Here are two example PCBs that utilize delay matching and delay tuning. On the left hand side, there's the back side of an FPGA based PCI Express hardware accelerator. On the right hand side, this is an AMD Xilinx Inc. system on chip based development board. Both of these boards have fairly high speed interfaces, such as DDR3 memory, gigabit ethernet, USB 2.0 high speed, and so on. If we zoom in to these pictures, you will notice that we have all of these squiggly traces, squiggly lines, sometimes differential pairs which have squiggles on them, single ended traces that have squiggles on them, or more formally known as meanders. Same thing on the right hand side. Even though this is a matte black solder mask underneath, you can see, for example, between the system on chip and the DDR3 memory ICs, we have a fair amount of parallel traces that also have their individual meanders. The question then becomes, why do we need these? How can we use them to do delay tuning, and delay matching? And what do we need to pay attention to? I'd like to give you the main ideas in this video. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. I used Altium Designer to design these boards and I'll show you how I did delay matching and tuning using Altium Designer. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below or go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's lab and you can get yourself an Altium Designer free trial as well as 25% off your first license purchase. A big thank you also to PCBWay, the boards you saw at the beginning of this video, and also the boards we'll be examining in this video were manufactured and assembled by PCBWay. These are fairly intricate boards with impedance control, high layer count, small feature sizes, and PCBWay did a great job manufacturing and assembling them. Make sure to check out their services, and I'll leave a link to them in the description box below. Lastly, if you'd like to learn more about advanced hardware design, I do have a new course out and I'll leave a link to this in the description below where you can check out the course content. There's about 11 and a half hours of content of creating your own FPGA based high speed digital systems. Let's start off with the basics before we go into more detail. First of all, what is delay matching even? Very simply speaking, for high speed interfaces, and this becomes more and more true the higher speed the interfaces are, and for various buses, we need to match the delays, not the lengths, as we'll see between the signals. This is to make sure that from the transmitter to the receiver, these signals, in for example, a parallel bus or within differential pairs, arrive at the receiver at the same time, plus minus some allowed margin, which depends on the interface standard. As we saw in the real world pictures just before, in the bottom side of this slide here, we can see how this is done in practice on a PCB. For example, on the left hand side, we have part of a DDR3 memory bus. These are the address command and control signals, which have to be delay matched and delay tuned so that from the transmitter, in this case, this is a system on chip, to the receiver, in this case, some memory modules, some DDR memory modules, the signals need to have the same propagation delay so they arrive at the receiver at the memory module at the same time. And by doing these meanders, or very simply speaking, these squiggles, we can achieve delays in those relevant signals. This is because electrical signals travel as electromagnetic waves are limited by the speed of light. And furthermore, in a dielectric material, such as in a PCB, this speed will be reduced as well. And therefore we have a propagation delay. I kept referring back to that we shouldn't do length matching. We should do delay matching. And let me show you why. The reason being that signals propagate at different speeds depending on the dielectric material, it depends on the trace geometry, and even depends on the loading. For simplification, we're just going to be looking at that the trace propagation delay depends on the dielectric constant of the material, as we said previously. Typically, you'll see that a trace propagation delay is given per length. So this could be nanoseconds per inch, it could be nanoseconds per millimeter, and so on. The equation here, so the trace propagation delay TPD per length is given by the square root of the dielectric constant divided by C, which is the speed of light. And the units are time per length. The variable we have here is epsilon, which is our dielectric constant. As you are probably aware, for, for example, an outer layer trace, we have a different dielectric constant than for typically an inner layer trace. And depending on what type of dielectric material we use between our forward and return path, this will of course alter the dielectric constant. We can use different cores, different prepregs, and these will have different epsilons, and therefore the trace propagation delay will change. This is shown on the right hand side. The top right shows a microstrip trace, so an external layer trace. We have a trace, we have a dielectric, and then we have a reference plane below. Below that, we have a strip line trace, which is an inner layer trace, where we have a plane above, a plane below, a trace in the middle, sandwiched between two dielectric materials. These could have the same dielectric constant or different dielectric constants. 
Depending on these arrangements, depending on the trace geometries, the dielectrics, we will get different values for epsilon. As an example, for a typical microstrip trace using an epsilon of 3.3, we get a propagation delay of about 6.1 picoseconds per millimeter. And for a typical strip line trace, let's say an epsilon of 4, we get a propagation delay of about 6.7 picoseconds per millimeter. As you can see, the difference is small, but there's still a difference between microstrip and strip line. Again, these are just examples and it depends on a few other factors as well. But typically, we can say that signals travel slower, there's more of a delay on inner layer traces. So if we just do length matching and we have some signals running on an outer layer trace and some on an inner layer trace, there will be a time difference, especially for long rooted traces, as this is a per millimeter quantity or per length quantity. And this is why we have to do delay matching. I'd strongly suggest using a calculator, both the microstrip and strip line, have a play around, see how the relative permittivity, how the distance between the forward path and return path, or the trace and the plane, the width of the trace and the trace thickness, so the copper thickness, impacts various parameters of that trace. In particular here, we can see the effective propagation delay in seconds per meter. So if I type in 3.3 is my dielectric constant, 0.1 millimeters is my height of the dielectric, width of trace and trace thickness, we can see I get about 5.2 nanoseconds per meter. If I decrease the relative permittivity, we can see that decreases the propagation delay. And I strongly suggest having a play around with something like this. Once we know that we have to match delays rather than lengths, the next question arises is what is an allowed timing margin? How many picoseconds or nanoseconds difference can we have between buses or within a differential pair or within groups of signals? And this is entirely dependent on the spec and the speeds you're running at. So the first suggestion is if you're designing a hardware system that uses, for example, USB 2.0, I'd look up the USB 2.0 spec and in there, they will tell you the timing margin. Similarly for PCI Express or DDR3, 4, 5 and so on. I'd strongly suggest having a look at this now for different specs and seeing how easy it is to figure out these numbers. You'll see this depends on the speed of the interface. So typically fast interfaces such as DDR5 compared to DDR3 need to have better matched delays. For example, looking at a typical application node or spec, for example, for DDR2 and DDR3 memory, we can see for DDR2, we might have a plus minus 20 picosecond allowed skew Whereas for DDR3, which is a faster interface, we'll have plus minus 10 picoseconds. And it really doesn't take long to find out these numbers. It's a quick web search. Another thing you need to take into account is that if you derate the speeds of your interfaces, so even though your system on chip or your controller and your memory might be able to run at a very high bandwidth, in certain cases you might not need that, and that eases the delay matching requirements on you as the PCB designer. Looking, for example, at a typical table, if we're running our controller at the maximum data rate at 1.3 gigabits per second and the memory at 1.3 gigabits per second, our maximum allowed skew or delay match margin is 10 p seconds. However, if we reduce the speeds, the bandwidths of these interfaces, we can see we quickly get much looser delay matching constraints. So 104 picoseconds or plus minus 150 picoseconds, for example. Unfortunately, however, a lot of data sheets and app notes and guidelines will still give mismatches in terms of length. So they'll say, oh, there's a 5 mil mismatch allowed or the 10 mil mismatch allowed, which of course assumes a certain outer layer or inner layer with a certain dielectric, a certain trace geometry and so on. And this is pretty bad practice because you'll have to somehow convert this into the units of time rather than length. Once you've chosen your interfaces, if you're routing USB 3, PCI Express, DDR, whatever, and you've figured out what your delay matching constraints are and your margins are, of course you'll have to start routing after you've laid out your system as usual. I won't be going into much detail, but I'll be giving you some main guidelines and tips. The first is that of same layer routing and same transitions. We discussed the delays, for example, for microstrips and for strip lines, that these have different delays, but we also have to be concerned with vias, so movement in the vertical or Z axis direction. The idea of same layer or same transition routing is that we don't want to worry about what the via delay is. So for signals in the same group and bus, we want to route them using the same layers. So we start, for example, on layer one, we route through a via and we route on, on layer three, which is our second signal layer. We've had the same layers, we had the same via transitions, and this makes our life a lot easier. This is because every signal in that group so if we're routing all of our memory bus signals then that same way, using the same layers, same vias, and same via lengths, every signal in that group will then spend, very simply speaking, an equal amount of time in each via. 
and therefore we don't need to be concerned about the z-axis delays because they'll be the same across all of the signals. We simply have to delay match on the layers on the traces rather than the vias. Again, the reason we want to do this is because the VIA delays themselves can be difficult to estimate. There are many models which give you an approximate estimate. You might need to use field solvers, or you can go the simple route, whereas Rick Hartley suggests, as a rule of thumb, if you're transitioning a VIA and want to calculate the propagation delay in that VIA, simply use the strip line trace propagation delay equation for the length of VIA you're transitioning in. However, to not have to deal with that, I'd recommend doing same layer and same transition routing. We can see this for this set red board. I have my memory controller, this AMD Xilinx Zinc system on chip, which routes to these two DDR3 memory modules. For the address command control signals, which is this blue group, we started at layer one. I fan out from the BGA, my dog bone fan out with a VIA and go down to layer eight. And all of my address command and control signals do the same transition. Start on layer one, same length VIA from layer one to layer eight, and then route on layer eight, all the way over to my first memory module, come up on layer one and root into my memory module. Then routing to my next memory module, I go from layer eight to layer six, I root up all the same vias, all the same layer transitions, layer one into my memory module. Same thing goes, for example, for the DDR data bus, all these white signals are routed on the same layer, have no via transitions, the yellow traces, also all the same layer, no vias, because I do not want to be worried about my Z axis transitions. I'd strongly suggest routing all of your signals first before you do any delay matching or delay tuning. So for example, for the address command control signals here of this DDR memory interface, I routed all of these signals over first, placed all of my vias first, of course, and only after that was done, after I've routed the whole memory interface, I began with my delay matching and my delay tuning. My delay matching, delay tuning consists of, for example, these meanders for single-ended signals, but also for these meanders for these differential signals. This is tool dependent, but for example, in Alton Designer, Alton Designer actually keeps track of the delays and not just the lengths of your system. So on the left hand side, if I go to my X signals, I have defined some groups, for example, the address command control, and we can see the delays listed from my memory controller to my first memory IC. If you look at the delays, these are all matched to be the same delay, not the same length, the same delay. So 426 picoseconds is a minimum and 430 picoseconds is a maximum. So matched within, if we take the average, plus minus two picoseconds, which is well within the DDR spec. So I try to match them as best as I can, but definitely within the spec that was given to me. The way I match that was simply to add in these meanders. And this is tool dependent again, just as a brief example to show you how I would do delay matching, we can see, for example, these white traces are part of a DDR3 byte group. On the left hand side, we can list the delays. Everything is pretty much matched to 200 picoseconds except for bit zero, this DQ0, which happens to be this trace in the center here. This is tool dependent, but every tool we're able to support this, all I want to do is go to root at the top, interactive length tuning, and click on a part of the trace. I can then drag in these meanders or these accordions and change the properties on the right hand side. On the left hand side, you can see now we are over the required delay. We want to match it to 200 picoseconds. And also this doesn't look very good. So first of all, I would like to decrease my amplitude, keeping spacing between other traces. And I don't like the look of these square corners. So I'll add a bit of a mitre in the bottom right. For example, something like so. We can also increase or decrease the spacing between these meanders. So I can make them closer together or further apart. We'll see this later, but we of course want to keep spacing between these meanders themselves. So with that in place, I can simply play with the spacing, with the heights, and aim to match this net to all the delays of all the other nets within that group. And here we go. That's how easy it is to do delay tuning. Other than single-ended signals, which you just saw, where we can simply add these meanders to, to match the delays between the various signals, we also have to be concerned with differential pairs. Differential pairs need to be delay matched, not just within the group, so between the differential pair and other signals within that group, so inter-pair matching, but also within the differential pair, so between the positive and negative parts or the traces of that pair. And this is called intra-pair matching. As usual, there's also a spec for the intra-pair matching, and we get that from the relevant datasheet, application note, or standard. For example, for DDR3, this typically allows a 5 picosecond max intra-pair skew. I would, in any case, regardless of which system it is, if it's USB 2, 3, PCI Express, and so on, I aim to match the positive-negative delays as best as you can, so as close to zero picosecond difference you can. 
The inter pair skew matching, you can see on the picture on the right hand side, are the meanders we saw already, but the intra pair skew matching is on the left hand side on just a single part of the differential pair, so only on one trace. And this is to match the delays within the differential pair. We want to perform the intra pair delay matching close to the cause of the intra pair skew and close to any other impedance discontinuity. Because doing this squiggle only on one line, very simply speaking, will of course change the impedance properties of that differential pair. Therefore, we want to do this intra-pair delay matching close to, for example, connectors, pads, vias, within a lump distance of any other impedance discontinuity. For example, looking at this USB high-speed differential pair, we can see the delays on the left-hand side, they're matched pretty much bang on to 84.47 picoseconds. Of course, there'll be variations depending on the material and so on, but I try to match them as best as I can within this pair. So the D minus and the D plus part of this differential pair is matched perfectly, and I'd really suggest doing that. It's very easy to do. To do this, all I had to do was add in this extra tiny length of trace, because without this, you can see the delay is mismatched by about 1.5 picoseconds, which is absolutely fine, especially for USB high speed. But I like to go to just that extra bit of effort and make this bang on. And as you can see, it's also close. And you can also see this impedance discontinuity. This intra pair matching is close to these pads as well. Finally, I'd just like to leave you with some additional tips that I always try to adhere to when doing delay matching or in systems that need delay matching. The first tip is that you should route first. Keep additional space between traces that you know need delay matching after. Once you've done the routing, keeping sufficient space between the traces, knowing where you need to delay match later on, only then I would delay match after routing all the signals within the group. This is what you can see here, for example, this white DDR byte lane. I've kept sufficient spacing between the traces such that I can place these meanders, these accordion shapes in between these other traces. This is to minimize crosstalk, it's improved signal integrity and EMI performance. I could of course bring the traces in like so even further if I am more space constrained, but remember to keep spacing between traces. So I've pre-planned this. I made sure I have enough space while I was routing before I did my delay matching to make sure I can add in these meanders that I have enough space to do so. Secondly, the typical trace spacing guidelines also apply to meanders. This is typically three times the height of the dielectric between the forward path and the return path. We don't just want to space traces far apart from each other, or as far as is reasonable. We want to also space the meanders away from other signals and also space out the meanders far enough that it doesn't interfere with itself. So for example, these meanders, I could have moved up here and also matched the delays somewhere like this, but then I'm bringing these meanders very close to other signals. What I also could have done is, of course, decrease the space in between these meanders, like so, but then I'm going to get interference within the own signal. Minimum of 3H spacing if you can within the meanders, and also meanders to other traces. Finally, it's also incredibly important and oftentimes overlooked, is that you need to include package delays of the ICs you're using. These can be sometimes hard to find, but typically you can find them using vendor tools, data sheets, or IBIS files. Package delays, for example, for this AMD Xilinx Sync system on chip, I enter directly into my footprint. So if I click on one of these pads on the right hand side, we can see this propagation delay here, 97 picoseconds for this. For D5, it's 61 picoseconds. For this pad, it's 94. For this, it's 76 and so on. And these are incredibly important to find out because as you see, these are quite significant. Some of them have a 20, 30, 40 picosecond, even more propagation delay. And given that some of our specs, for example, for DDR3 are only plus minus 10 picoseconds, if we don't take these package delays into account, we'll violate the spec. The package delays are due to how the chip or the IC die itself is bonded out to the package. And so this really needs to be taken into account. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it gave you some tips and ideas for doing delay matching and delay tuning in your own PCB designs. If you like the video, please do leave a like, a comment if you have any questions, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with the latest PCB and hardware design videos. Thanks again, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.